everyone. Thank you for joining the inaugural BCG Health Tech panel series. In this series, we feature worldwide leaders to gain their insights on health technology innovations. I am Ariel Rothman, and today's moderator is Nate Bayer, Managing Director and Partner at BCG. We are so excited to introduce our two panelists here today to discuss the role of the human in a healthcare world increasingly supported by AI. We have here Dr. John Halamka, President of the Mayo Clinic Platform, and Ashima Gupta, Global Director of Healthcare Strategy and Solutions at Google Cloud. I will pass it off to Nate, who will begin the discussion. Thank you both for joining. Uh, looking forward to this discussion. Uh, we, when we were, as we were leading into this, you know, we were already sort of getting getting into some of the content here on uh, generative AI, which of course is is a very important topic uh, today, and will be one for for quite a while. Um, within healthcare, and, and this is true across industries, but I think especially true in healthcare, one of the, one of the things that is top of mind for many people is humans in the loop. So where are humans? supposed to be in the loop? Where do they need to be in the loop? Where could they be in the loop? Where couldn't they be in the loop? Uh, and I think this is, this is a topic for me that I'm, I feel like every week my perspective evolves on this as I see, see change in the industry, quite frankly. Uh, and so, uh, you know, with, with that in mind, you know, I, I think about a, a lot of the conversations about AI enabling humans, but increasingly my mindset is more, you know, where, where is this going to you know, fundamentally disrupt where, where humans uh, uh, are, are going to be in the loop? And with that, I want to start with a very pointed question, which is, when is it more responsible for the AI to take over from the humans in medicine? Ashima, I'll, I'll lead with you. Thank you, Nate. Thank you for having me here. I would start by saying medicine is more than just a science. It's, it's also an art, the art of caring for another human being, the art of building trust and rapport the art of making someone feel comfortable and safe when they are scared or are in a vulnerable moment. So in that context, AI is not going to take over humans in medicine. There's a role for AI to play. And as you, as you started, it is a, it's a human sidekick. It's an assistant, it's an augmentation. Think of this as a microscope, microscope just like microscope let us see things that were not uh, fully seen by human eye. That's what AI is good at. That's what the large language models can do, help sift through mountains of data and for help find insights for the doctors, for the physicians and augment them. That's helpful. So for you, there's something that's sort of necessarily human about, about care at all. And you know, medicine is, is really about care. And so there, there is a humanity in that. And, and this is more about a tool to, to accelerate how we can advance almost the, the, the scientific side of it while not removing the care side of it. John, what do you see from your perspective? Do you see places where it's more responsible for, for humans to be out of the loop? Humans alone will miss 20% of the lesions in a colonoscopy. Humans augmented, as Ashma said, by AI will only miss 3%. So, I still agree with what Ashima said, augmented uh, human behavior is best. But how about this? Five years from now, it may be that doing colonoscopy without AI augmentation will be malpractice. Mm -hmm. And where would you see the threshold where the AI should take the human out of the loop altogether on that? And the reason why I ask that is you think about just very simply, if the AI is used as a triage tool to you know, highlight hotspots for the, the human clinicians to take a look at. You are implying some sort of statistical threshold where, where their eyes should track to that in order to make that diagnosis. Arguably, the AI, AI could do that completely. Where is the value of the human in that diagnostic step? Because I think what you're articulating is, is distinct from the care that, that Ashima was, was talking about. Yeah, but so everything has to be done through the lens of risk. And if I ask an AI to write an appeal letter to Blue Cross for a denied claim, I think we can agree that's a pretty low risk activity. If on the other hand, I'm asking the AI to propose a diagnosis or therapy, that's a pretty high risk activity. So in draft legislation and uh, regulation, CMS, you know, Medicare, Medicaid are suggesting that really doctors must 
provide the oversight examining the recommendations of AI before applying them to patients. There is no AI does it all on its own concept. That's helpful. That's helpful. And I, that risk lens is great too, because it also will hold humans accountable to the same standards of risk as, as some of these systems start to, to expand. So, in, and I think we're trending towards this. The second question is where are we always going to need humans in medicine? Where is there a place where AI just fundamentally can't disrupt that? Remember, AI is math, not magic. And so can an AI look at a million patients and say, oh, patients like you had this journey? Absolutely. Can an AI understand your particular values, respect what it is you want, or offer empathy? Not so much. <laughs> The way that I uh, sometimes my mentors described it is if AI can replace your doctor, AI should replace your doctor because most people go to the doctor for respect and empathy and not just digesting the facts. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like when you look at the, the reviews online, they have far more to do with bedside manner than clinical outcomes, right? And that inevitably won't, won't go away. Ashima, I think that links to some of the direction that you were going in with your first response as well. Do you have a build on that? Yeah, I, absolutely. I think as Dr. Lanka said, human will always be needed in medicine because we have unique abilities in, in humanities to empathize, to judge, to create reasoning, and importantly, to provide human touch. And as Dr. Lanka, where he was going, can you make that connection better? Can you augment that connection? Can you bring and surface insight when a physician is making that human connection? I think that's where we believe very strongly that AI can be a very powerful assistant. There are many use cases, uh, especially in traditional AI, and I'm making a distinction between traditional AI and generative AI. Traditional AI, as we all have seen it, very tuned for a task. It is um, very good for seeing uh, pattern recognition, making prediction, decision-making. Generative AI is where uh, it's, it's completely different in, in the sense that it's very general use. It's trained on a large language um, model data set as an example, and we would need a responsible use for that. So in addition to medicine, I believe humans are needed to make sure that we steer this technology to the better use of humanities, uh, you know, in, in terms of both ethical concerns, responsible, uh, it's to make it safe, it's reliable, it's ethical, so even in the development of AI, humans are needed, not just in the practice from the medicine perspective. That's super helpful. So there's almost like a, a governance or whether or not it's regulation, but um, humans are needed as a sort of an overarching, uh, they got to direct the AI and, and kind of coach it in the right direction. Uh, right direction. I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, last question is really on how soon do you expect the world to feel completely different in terms of, of you know, AI adoption and impact in medicine? And I would have to think that this human role of not letting AI just run unfettered into clinical practice is inevitably going to slow things down, but in a productive way. Um, but how do you think that, that these, these forces will, will play out in terms of you know, really changing the landscape in, in terms of how we feel about AI in medicine? Well, last week I was at Mayo Clinic and an EKG was done on me and 14 algorithms were run on it. And instantly there was again, human augmented decision-making provided by the algorithms that help the clinicians achieve a diagnosis and recommend a, a treatment. It's, it's already there. Now, William Gibson, of course, taught us that the future is here. It's just unevenly distributed. And I think, yes, it will be a few years before you see 50% or more of healthcare institutions using AI clinical decision support or generative AI for low risk tasks. I am already starting to see, and you've seen press releases on this, the notion that administrative notes, summaries can be created through generative AI and then edited by humans for accuracy. There's gonna be a lot of pressure to adopt solutions like that because of burnout. The, and the just administrative burden facing clinicians today. So again, you know, I think pretty ubiquitous in the next couple of years. Yes. I would add to that, Nate, as Dr. Lanka is saying, and, and what you alluded to, 
make no mistakes. We are now at a pivotal moment in the AI journey. And the traditional AI to generative AI is a big, big breakthrough. And it's gonna fundamentally change how people interact with technology across all different industries and healthcare is no exception. So um, I would go back and say simply like how the introduction of a mobile platform created a whole ecosystem of app developers, companies that built on that platform and unleashed new wave of creativity via that junction. Where as these foundation models through generative AI become more accessible, get in hands of each, like developer, governments, organizations, we will see a plethora of, we call it Gen AI applications. So that's where we, we are seeing unleashing of creativity, people thinking about it in terms of bringing AI to the masses. And, and, and that's real, realizing the potential of this technology does mean that, that it needs to be accessible. But the guardrails are important, as Dr. Halamka said. But a decade ago, we did that with mobile ecosystem as the sold, as businesses and developers gained safe, secure, and powerful tools to build mobile applications, we saw a whole ecosystem develop. And we are in that uh, junction now. I will also share a few weeks ago, we, um, Google, we announced our MedFarm 2. It is our foundation model on medical uh, ontology. It is consistently performing as an expert doctor level on medical exams. So 85% score on the US MLE exam. That is the model that has been trained. Now it's still not ready for the real world settings, but it tells you the potential. Here is a model that, that is answering questions on a US licensing exam with 85% accuracy. What do you do with that, right? We are now inviting early access kind of customers, developers, partners to help build and, and reimagine new applications, new experiences. And they will be, we have a whole category of them. I won't rattle them out, but from digital experience, concierge to clinical documentation, generation, synthesis to website navigation to creating a next generation Q&A on the website or digital properties. So we will see a variety of use cases, some we know now, some we, won't, we don't even know yet. Fantastic. Well, I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you both for the dialogue. This was great. And uh, look forward to connecting with both of you again in the future. Ariel, any, any other comments to close? No, thank you so much for joining. Really enjoyed hearing your insights and thanks for taking the time. Well, always happy to help. And remember, technology is evolving so fast. We're happy to come back and give you an update in a quarter. Exactly. 90 days. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Nate. Bye-bye.